Bone density is one of those things most people don't think about, but it can literally save your life when you're old. Low bone density is a major risk factor for death from falls and hip fractures. Falls are the leading cause of accidental deaths in the US among people over the age of 75. Having high bone density, on the other hand, means that your body is strong and resilient. You're less likely to get injured no matter your age, and you feel less aches and pains. In this video, I'm going to share with you how I got my bone density to be three standard deviations above normal, and what you can do to achieve extraordinarily high bone density. Bone density also called bone mineral density refers to the amount of bone minerals in the bone. The higher the score, the stronger the bones are. The most common minerals in the bone are calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, fluoride, and sodium. Healthy bones have plenty of minerals and they're dense, whereas in osteoporosis, the mineral content of the bones is low, which is why it increases the risk of fractures and breaking bones. Bone density starts decreasing already at a quite an early age. Women start losing bone mass rapidly after menopause but it's seen that men start losing bone density even earlier than that, 25 to 35 years of age. Men do have more total bone mass to begin with, but the decline can begin already in the 30s for both men and women. How do you know your bone density? The gold standard method is the DEXA scan that looks at your body fat, muscle mass, and bone density. Bone density is reflected in three forms. The first is the areal density in grams per square centimeter. This reflects the concentration of bone minerals within a given square centimeter of bone. The second is the Z-score. How does your bone density compare to other people of your age, sex, and ethnicity? It's measured in numbers of standard deviations. For example, a Z-score of 1 is 1 standard deviations above normal, which is good, whereas a Z-score of minus 2 is 2 standard deviations below normal, which is bad. The T-score also measures bone density in standard deviations, but is compared to a healthy 30-year-old of the same sex and ethnicity. It's been found in studies that people with a Z-score of over 1 have the lowest risk of mortality and heart disease compared to those with a z-score of less than 1 and less than minus 1. So basically high bone density means that you have a high z and t score and you have high areal density. I've done two DEXA scans over the last year and they've shown my bone density is significantly higher than other people of my age. For example my spine z-score is plus 3 which is 3 standard deviations above the average of my age and sex and my t-score is plus 2.9. My areal density is 1.5 grams per square centimeter, which as you can see from the graph is also at the peak of all age groups. My bone density in my femur bones is also high, but not as high as in my spine. In my left femur bone, my T and Z scores are 0.5, and my areal density is 1.2, which are both well above normal. Now, yes, I am 30 years old, but remember that the Z score is based on people of your chronological age. So a Z score of 3 still means that I'm 3 standard deviations above what other people of my age would be. So it's not comparing apples to oranges, it's comparing apples to apples. Genetics does affect bone density, but my dad has had back surgery and my mom has had a knee surgery, which would indicate that I don't have excellent genetics for fractures or joint injuries. I've never broken a bone in my life, despite having grown up on the countryside and doing physical work since childhood. So how did I get such a high bone density, especially in my spine? The biggest and most profound reason for that is doing weight-bearing exercise. I've been lifting weights for 12 years since high school and I've never taken a time off for any longer than two weeks. When your body is encountering weight resistance, the muscles and tendons apply tension to the bones, which signals the bones to produce more bone tissue. It works in a similar manner as for the muscles. If there's no mechanical tension, then your muscles aren't going to grow. And without mechanical tension applied to the bones, the bones aren't going to get stronger either. This is what you can't achieve with daily living activities, such as carrying your groceries, vacuuming, doing the dishes, etc. None of these activities are heavy enough to stimulate bone formation. This is also the reason why everyone should do some form of resistance training. Because you're not promoting bone density with everyday activities, you need resistance training. A 2008 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that just walking isn't enough to preserve bone density and strength. So walking and doing everyday activities isn't enough. On the other hand, there are many studies showing that resistance training increases bone density and reduces the risk of osteoporosis. It can even reverse it. A 2022 meta-analysis of clinical trials found that resistance training programs with 4 to 5 exercises, 2 to 3 sets per exercise, 8 to 12 reps at 70 to 90% of your 1 rep max, 60 to 120 second rest between sets, done 3 times a week for 12 to 52 weeks, was found to be effective for increasing bone mineral density in the hips and spine, but not the femoral neck. 
another 2022 clinical trial on postmenopausal women with osteoporosis found that six months of resistance training was able to increase bone mineral density and prevent future bone loss. So it doesn't matter if you already have low bone density or not. You would certainly need to do weight-bearing exercise because that's the only way to stimulate bone formation in a reliable manner. If you don't lift weights, then the natural process of aging will slowly deteriorate away at your bone density. Exercise training also reduces the rate of falls and number of people falling in older people. That's because of a combination of higher muscle strength, better mobility and balance. This is the biggest factor that has contributed to the bone density in my spine specifically. I do primarily compound exercises that all train my core and spine, such as heavy barbell squats, deadlifts, rows, overhead press, bench press, pull-ups, etc. My spine is always engaged and it's always under tension when I'm exercising, which is why I have a very strong core and strong spine. Compare that to my hip bone density, which is higher than normal, but not as high as my spine. That's because my femur bones aren't engaged in every exercise. They only get trained when I'm doing squats and a little bit when I'm doing deadlifts. I train squats once a week or once every two weeks, but my spine is getting trained every workout several times a week. That's why my goal for the next few years is to increase my hip and femur bone bone density to one standard deviations above normal. The way I'm going to do that is to do more exercises that target the hips, such as deeper barbell squats and maybe some hip thrusts. Overall, no matter your age, resistance training with especially barbells is the most powerful and most effective way to increase your bone density. You should aim for at least two resistance training workouts per week, but optimally three times. Besides resistance training, there are also other things that support bone growth. Here's the list of the most important things. Higher protein intake. Protein intake correlates with higher bone mineral density. That's because protein is a building block for bones and it stimulates bone forming cells. It's found that older people with a protein intake below 15% of total energy intake have a higher risk of hip fractures. I'm eating about 0.8 grams per pound or 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per day for protein. In total, that's gonna be something around 20 to 25% of my total calories. This is also the amount that maximizes muscle hypertrophy, so you don't need to consume more than that. Protein rich foods are also more likely to contain various minerals needed for the bones, such as calcium and phosphorus especially. However, some minerals like boron and magnesium you can get predominantly from lower protein foods, like prunes and raisins. So you'd want to eat various different foods. Calcium is thought to be the most important mineral for bone density, but the research on that is quite limited. Increasing calcium intake from diet or supplements does increase bone mineral density slightly, but only by about 1%, as shown by a 2015 meta-analysis of 59 randomized controlled trials. Supplementing with calcium hasn't been seen to reduce the risk of fractures either. However, it might be that you need a much higher calcium intake to see an effect. Because in most of these studies, the average calcium intake was somewhere between 800 to 1000 milligrams per day. One study on postmenopausal Swedish women found that only a consistently high intake, 1400 to 2400 milligrams a day, increased bone mineral density. You definitely don't want to be calcium deficient, but whether or not you need to consume very large amounts of calcium to support your bone density is not very clear. About 50% of the bone volume and one third of bone mass is made of collagen, which is a protein that provides structural integrity for the bone. A 2018 randomized controlled trial found that supplementing 5 grams of collagen peptides per day increased bone mineral density in postmenopausal women. Another 2023 study found that combining jumping exercise with collagen supplementation in elite cyclists preserved bone mineral density, whereas it decreased in the control group. They took 15 grams of hydrolyzed collagen before exercise. These studies suggest that taking 5 to 15 grams of collagen does support bone density. But another 2023 study found that ingesting 30 grams of collagen before resistance training was more effective than 15 grams in increasing whole body collagen synthesis. This would refer to the structural integrity of the tendons, but not the bones. However, tendon strength is also very important. So if your goal is just bone density, then 5 to 15 grams of collagen works, but 30 grams of collagen appears to be more optimal. Interestingly, taking a sauna might increase bone mineral density. A 2021 randomized controlled trial found that 12 sessions of sauna at 100 degrees Celsius increased muscle mass and bone density slightly compared to the control group. The mechanism is thought to be mediated by heat shock proteins that increase osteogenesis, the formation of bone cells, as well as growth hormone. However, exposure to warmth appears to also improve bone 
bone strength through the gut microbiome by increasing the production of polyamines like spermidine. So the saunas could be beneficial for bone density and bone health, but there's not enough evidence to make any conclusive claims. Vitamin D is another important hormone needed for strong bones. Low vitamin D levels are a risk factor for bone loss and bone demineralization. You need vitamin D for calcium absorption and bone mineralization. When it comes to supplementing with vitamin D, then it's not very clear. A 2023 Cochrane meta-analysis of seven randomized controlled trials found that vitamin D supplementation has no effect on bone mineral density in healthy premenopausal women. Another 2018 meta-analysis of 81 randomized controlled trials concluded that vitamin D supplementation doesn't prevent fractures or falls, nor does it have clinically meaningful effects on bone mineral density. So it's better to get your vitamin D from the sunlight rather than relying on supplements. But fixing vitamin D deficiency with supplementation could be worth it. Before I continue on, I'll briefly mention to you about one of my favorite longevity gadgets, which is the Bond Charge Infrared Sauna Blanket. It's a cheaper and more convenient way to take the sauna anywhere at any time. I've talked a lot about the benefits of regular sauna use. I believe taking a sauna regularly is the second best thing for your longevity after exercise. In fact, the sauna mimics a lot of the health benefits of exercise. The sauna is also effective for excreting heavy metals and other chemicals we are exposed to on a daily basis. The Bond Charge Infrared Blanket is made of pure leather and it's low in EMF. It's got a rating of 4.9 out of 5 based on 176 reviews which is crazy. But I'm not surprised because I'm using the blanket almost every day and it gets the same job done as a regular sauna. Plus it's easy to clean and you can store it under your bed. Alright, back to the video. Vitamin K1 and K2 intake is another thing that might reduce the risk of fractures. A 2019 review concluded that K1 supplementation does reduce the risk of hip fractures, but the evidence is considered low quality. A 2015 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that vitamin K2 supplementation at a dose of 1.5 mg a day improved bone mineral density in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, but not in those without osteoporosis. So vitamin K1 and K2 intake does appear to support bone health and bone density. But the evidence that supplementing K1 and K2 would reduce the risk of fractures is not very strong. You get K1 from leafy greens and K2 from natto and fermented foods as well as liver. Lastly, I want to talk about omega-3s because they have been shown to support not only heart health but also bone health. Dietary intake of omega-3s is positively associated with bone mineral density. This could be because fish and seafood is high in protein, as well as minerals. However, there could be some specific effects from the omega-3 fats. A 2021 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that omega-3 supplements enhance bone mineral density, especially in postmenopausal women. A 2010 NASA study found that omega-3 supplementation during bed rest can counteract bone loss, making it a viable supplement for astronauts. A higher omega-3 status is beneficial for many reasons besides just bone health. Omega-3s help with heart health, brain health, diabetes risk, inflammation, muscle growth, and yes, bone density as well. Out of all the things that are listed here, resistance training is by far the most powerful and most effective way to increase bone mineral density. It doesn't matter what diet or supplement you take, if you're not doing some form of weight-bearing exercise. To know your bone density, you'd want to get a DEXA scan. If your bone density is below normal, then you definitely need to start focusing on resistance training and a higher protein intake to reverse that. The same applies to normal bone density. You don't want to be just normal because bone density will decline with age. You want to have at least one standard deviation above normal, which you can only achieve with resistance training, especially compound lifts that train the spine and hips. Eating a higher protein diet that covers your essential minerals is also important but eating a high protein diet without doing resistance training isn't going to increase your bone density that much. It might do so a little bit, but not that much. There aren't many supplements for bone density, and most of them are shown to be ineffective. The exception is omega-3s and perhaps vitamin K1 and K2. So it all comes down to resistance training and weight-bearing exercise. If you want to learn about how I reduced my visceral fat from good to great, then check out this video. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.